um, very generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Um, and um, as uh, Jens explained, I'm going to try to explain um, why is it that the Syrian revolution is and has become invisible, and why is it that geopolitical reading uh, has been uh, dominant uh, when it comes to the Syrian revolution. The title of my talk is The Syrian Tragedy, A Global Design, Regional Maps, and the Invisible Revolution. And one of the things that's been happening in the past two, two and a half years is we haven't seen uh, much reporting uh, from the ground up. We haven't seen much writing about the grassroots movement that are you know, very active in Syria. We haven't seen much of the voices of the Syrian who are actively working to rebuild the so their society, to recreate their society, to restructure it. Um, and most of the talk has been really about the military aspect of, of the revolution. And I'm going to argue that the military aspect is just really the tip of the iceberg, that the hidden part is much more important. The hidden part is actually what makes the military aspect possible um, and sustainable. Um, and that's you know, been happening for the past uh, two and a half years. Um, and I usually start, and we had a workshop earlier, a very interesting and productive workshop with activists who are working on the question of Syria. And um, I'm meeting many uh, activists, more and more actually, since the potential uh, strike a few weeks ago, a month ago. People are uh, more hopeful and they want to work uh, and uh, be active in, uh, in working with the question of Syria. And I usually start with a slogan that comes from, um, from Egypt, but also uh, the Syrian revolution borrowed that slogan. It became very popular in Syria. The betrayal is, um, despair is betrayal. Uh, we can't um, feel that betrayal. We have to be hopeful, despite you know, the violence and the killing and the aggressive uh, you know, violence of, of the Syrian regime. Uh, we have to be hopeful. Um, that's our only option right now. Um, as uh, Jens mentioned, I spent almost two months in uh, the liberated area in, uh, in Syria, and I visited many cities, uh, but I mostly stayed in Menbij, which is half an hour uh, from the, the Turkish borders. Um, and it was a really critical period. Um, it was a period when Obviously, we had the, the usual airstrikes, um, and uh, there are no anti-craft uh, guns in Menbij, so all we do is wait and hope for the best, um, you know, whenever we see an airplane in the sky. And that was usually um, um, happening on a weekly basis. But more interestingly, um, there was a re-emergence of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was present since um, early 2012, but uh, during the summer, um, they started coming from you know, those liberated areas and taking over city after city after city, um, the liberated cities. Uh, cities that were controlled by the FSA, the Free Syrian Army, uh, cities that were controlled by uh, you know, the civilian population and were functioning uh, well. They started taking them over and they have been um, you know, putting activists in prison, uh, oftentimes torturing them and most recently killing them. I lost a friend I met during the summer just two weeks ago. Um, very, um, very joyful, happy person, always smiling. And he was found two weeks ago uh, in, early, in the early morning with his uh, hand attached behind his back and two bullets in his head. Um, and this happening to many activists. Actually, uh, the most recent census that we have uh, apparently, the Al Qaeda, uh, and here I'm talking about uh, the state, uh, the Islamic State, because there are different um, groups. The uh, Islamic State (ISIS) um, has currently around 1,500 activists, people who have been actively opposed to the Syrian regime since day one. Um, you know, they're media activists, they're organizers, they're people who were um, actively uh, organizing protests and, and so on, networking. Uh, doing workshops, you know, um, uh, about civil disobedience and so on. 1,500 of them are currently in, um, in the prisons controlled by Al-Qaeda in the northern part of, of Syria. Uh, and so the question is, why is that? And why is it that we hear so much about the revolution and Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda is doing this, and Al-Qaeda doing that, and people really conflating Al-Qaeda with the revolution. And what I want to suggest today is that um, the Syrian revolution is actually uh, trapped between, on the one hand, the Syrian regime and the front that's been active for the past two and a half years. But there is a new front, and that front is uh, you know, much more porous. It's among the population. It seems peaceful um, or um, not really military, 
but it's actively undermining the revolution um, every day, um, very actively since the past uh, three, three, three or four weeks. Um, I met many, many activists um, in, um, during my trip, um, several hundreds, and people who were very, very influential in several cities, Raqqa and Menbej and uh, um, Aleppo and Saraqib and so on. And many of those activists are currently in Turkey, one person is in Brazil, and, and so on. They have been expelled from the city, they were threatened, uh, Al-Qaeda told them that they will be killed, that their head will be um, shown at the gate of the city, and so on. So they have to leave. Uh, and they told me, I was actually talking to one of them, who was uh, very actively um, you know, uh, organizing against the Syrian regime in Raqqa, and is currently in Turkey, uh, in Ghazi Antab. He told me, this is really um, temporal, and I'm going to go back, uh, but I'm just waiting for the right moment. I'm not losing your hope, I, I'm gonna go back. Uh, they can't steal our revolution. <clears throat> so I want to really um, explore um, and tell you a little bit about Menbij. And I think um, Menbij is really interesting um, because it's one of those cities that was really neglected by the Syrian regime. It was isolated, it's in the middle of the desert. Um, so, you know, um, that's, that's been really uh, good for them. Um, they're actually lucky uh, to have had that. They're lucky to have been neglected because there are no military bases around the city. And because of that, their city has been preserved after liberation, unlike other cities. Raqqa, for example, has been liberated since um, April 2013, and um, there are, you know, shelling, there is shelling against the city every day. Every day, um, you know, new buildings are targeted, a new neighborhood are targeted because of this military base, uh, base number 17, um, that's um, in the northern suburb of, of the city. Manbij doesn't have that. There are no military bases in Manbij, and therefore the city was preserved. But in addition to that, the liberation of the city has been really interesting. There were protests. In the beginning, they were really isolated and small. People were very scared. Um, those of you who are Syrian and know, you know the violence of the Syrian regime know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, if you are active, you're incarcerated. Many of the activists I talked to actually have been to prison. They have been tortured. Many of them thought that they were you know, uh, going to die under torture. They were thinking about their relatives and so on. And so they were all uh, experiencing that type of, of violence. And yet they were able to uh, prevent the militarization of their city. And the Free Syrian Army was extremely marginal in the city. And they were able to liberate their city entirely peacefully. Uh, the day of the liberation of the city, um, there was a small uh, free, free Army, um, Free Syrian Army group who owned 17 machine guns. That's all they had in the city. I'm talking about a city with 200,000 um, Resident plus another 200,000 200, refugees. And yet, we haven't heard much about that struggle and that organizing. And you know, it's a it's massive scale uh, happening almost for 18 months after the liberation of, of the city. It's not interesting to the media, it's not interesting to politicians, to you know, uh, whether they are Syrian or not. Um, it's not necessarily interesting to even people who take risk coming from uh, Canada or the US or Italy and, and France, because for the most part, those journalists, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I, um, I appreciate the risk that they're taking and their courage and so on, but for the most part, they're interested in the military aspect and they're going to talk about Al-Qaeda and they're going to talk about militarization and so on. And they're going to have stories and reports from the fronts, not from the liberated cities, not from the extremely important work that um, the um, you know the civilian population is doing, and this recreation of um, their city and rethinking of their culture and um, um, restructur restructuration of uh, the different institutions that are necessary for the survival uh, and the governance of, of the city. And so I'm trying to understand here, and um, I'm going to uh, diverge a little bit and you know talk about Menbej a bit. Uh, later uh, in my talk, but try to understand why is it that um, this, you know, this revolution that I saw on the ground and this vibrant activism that people are involved in and thousands and thousands peop of people, you know, working to help the refugees and working to provide water and, and food and, and bread to the city and make it manageable and, you know, function, functioning. Why is it that this 
is not part of what we hear? Why is it that it's not part of the narrative about Syria? Um, why is it invisible? Why is it that we don't hear those voices and, and so on? And I'm going to argue that um, we are probably using the wrong uh, theoretical framework to really examine uh, the Syrian revolution. Part of that problem is, for the most part, the media discussion and even discussion in uh, academic circles and uh, among you know, uh, intellectuals and so on, has been using the geopolitical framework as a sole way to understand what's happening. Um, the idea that there are states with interest and they are the only players, and uh, they are trying to construct different maps, different states with different <coughs> geostrategic maps. Um, so that's one of the framework that's been used uh, by, um, by those experts and people who talk about, about Syria. The other way to talk about Syria is through the Marxist political economy or macroeconomy, uh, again, a top-down kind of perspective, where you don't necessarily have to um, you know, interact with activists, with people on the ground, but rather try to understand the structure of the population, of the classes, the class struggle, imperialism, all these big questions without necessarily um, you know, um, engaging with the population and um, seeing uh, what is really happening on, on the ground. And the third perspective um, is um, left or right leaning kind of humanitarian, humanitarianism. Um, and so, as I said, the first and second ones, um, the uh, geopolitical and uh, the uh, political economy, have a top-down kind of approach um, without necessarily engaging with the population. The problem with the humanitarian approach is that it denies any kind of agency to the Syrian and perceives them only as victims. Uh, and that's been a real problem. I don't want to um, deny or downplay the work of many organizations and activists and um, you know, volunteers who are working with uh, those international or national organizations to provide to the refugees, to provide to uh, people who need um, you know, um, help. But I'm going to argue that Syrians who are involved in those, um, in those organizations are, perceive their work actually as part of the revolution as part of a revolution, um, as part of an effort that makes the revolution really possible. Um, they don't perceive their, their work as helping people who need the help. They don't perceive it as you know, helping the victims. Uh, and that's, I think, a big uh, difference that we need to um, um, understand. So the way I want to engage with the Syrian revolution is a bit different. Uh, and here I borrow from Henri Lefebvre, a French philosopher, who think that we can study and analyze any space in two different ways. Uh, the first one is to look at the space as an abstract space. Um, and the second one is looking at that same space as a lived space. The abstract space is the top-down uh, top approach, as looking at space from an airplane, really abstract, really uh, from far away. Um, and that's the kind of space that politicians, experts, urban planners, I'm not trashing them, I'm, also working, I work on urban, urbanism as well. And I think there is value to do that. I'm not discounting that. Um, but they're really bureaucrats. They look at the space in, in a cold manner and um, top-down manner. Um, but there is another way to look at that same space, um, what Lefebvre calls the lift space. And that allows us, and I think it brings a very different lens to looking at, uh, at the Syrian revolution. Uh, because we have to engage with the people, the population, uh, who are engaged, uh, who are um, you know, making that revolution uh, possible. Understand the desire and their aspiration and their emotion, pain and sentiments and, and so on. And I think this is important to tell the whole story. Um, we have to do that in combination with the geopolitical uh, reading and uh, with the political economy. So this is what I'm advocating for here. Really try to understand the Syrian, the Syrian revolution from the lived space, from the multiple practices, you know, thousands of thousands of Minishe uh, acts of resistance that are happening every day, uh, every minute, uh, that make the Syrian revolution possible uh, and you know, make it last uh, for so long and make even the military aspect of the revolution dimension uh, possible. Um, so I'm going to provide a reading of this, uh, what, I, uh, what I call the geopolitical reading. Um, and I contend that there are five or six different layers. Oftentimes when we hear the geopolitics and uh, we hear that kind of analysis, oftentimes it's re reduced what, to what the US and Russia are doing. And I think that there are actually several overlapping maps, several overlapping geopolitical that are happening. 
And um, sometimes they are overlapping, sometimes there are, there are tensions between the interest of those uh, different states, as I'm going to uh, show here. And the reason for this multiplicity of reading of the different geopolitical maps is because, uh, I think, um, the declining power of the US. In the past, in 20, 30 years ago, um, you know, when the US had a specific agenda in the region, for the most part, the local players um, had to follow. Um, there was not much room for negotiation. Right now, because of the declining power of the US and because of the um, major uh, economic crisis and so on, um, there is much more room for negotiation. So, for example, Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Israel and so on are going, going to differ with the US and are going to have their own agenda, which doesn't always match with, I mean, there is a lot of overlapping, but doesn't always match with the US agenda. Um, and therefore, the fragmentation of those different um, maps that we could, we could superimpose to really understand that geopolitical um, aspect of, of the revolution. So let's start with uh, the first one, which is the mini Cold War between Russia and the US that we are all aware of. And that's really the main story, the dominant story that we hear about and, um, and know through the media and uh, that many people uh, talk about. And, um, I will argue um, against common sense that the U.S. is not really interested in Syria. Uh, actually, it is trying to, it's very indecisive uh, on what is to be done in Syria. Um, and that the U.S. interest is actually shifting to Central Asia and East Asia um, for reasons that we can talk about. But basically, and very briefly, because of the, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, Increasing power of the Chinese economic, um, the Chinese economic power, uh, but also for um, the financial re uh, financial crisis, uh, global terrorism, and environmental reasons. So the U.S. is really looking there, uh, and that's been happening since uh, actually a second mandate of Bush, not uh, uh, during the Obama uh, campaign. But Obama is following through in that uh, same path. And so um, the U.S. wasn't really uh, interested in uh, interfering or intervening in Syria, but rather trying to contain uh, the Russian influence in the region. Um, so that's why um, they're there, and um, they might have you know, uh, um, a different geopolitical map. The second reason for uh, the U.S. Uh, interest in the region is containing the uh, momentum of the Arab revolts. Uh, as you know, uh, Mubarak and Ben Ali were close allies to the U.S., and there, were, there was fear in, uh, in the West, in the U.S., and other places, that this movement could be contagious, and it could go other, uh, to other places. I'm actually uh, very interested in the Occupy movement, uh, and I've been to many places, and I talk to people in the U.S. and in Montreal here in, in Canada, and many, many people were actually saying that uh, they were inspired by the uh, Egyptian revolution and that their movement would had, would had, wouldn't have been possible without the Egyptian um, revolution. And I think that is something that uh, the political elite in the US and elsewhere understood, uh, the importance of the Arab revolts and the need to contain those Arab revolts. And the militarization and the violence in Syria made that possible because other Arab population doesn't necessarily want to replicate that. They don't necessarily want to revolt against uh, their dictator and have um, that, um, that kind of violence and militarization and destruction in, in their, um, in their um, countries. The third reason is that uh, the political elite and sometimes the media in the West um, <coughs> was um, embedded in this orientalist framework uh, where you know, they see Arab radicals, extremists, fundamentalist radicals, um, and the Muslim question is really central, and the need to liberate their women who are veiled, and, and all that kind of rhetoric. Um, and um, you know, just to give you an example, uh, when, for example, Sarah Palin said, let Allah sort, sort it out to, um, you know, to reject any kind of uh, intervention or interference uh, on behalf of the U.S. in the region uh, because you know, they're killing each other and they're Muslim and let Allah do it for them. Uh, we shouldn't go there. Um, but she was really um, saying out, uh, aloud what many politicians think uh, privately or, or silently. Uh, and I think you know, if, if you look at some of uh, the media uh, reports about the region and, and so on, this is really a dominant um, uh, framework. Uh, 
the idea that they're extremists, they're, they're killing, they're beheading, and, and so on. Obviously, some of that is happening, but this is not the entire story, um, as I would suggest. Um, and so um, the U.S. didn't mind, like other countries, um, to see a long war of attrition of, um, on the one hand, Al-Qaeda and jihadist um, fighting um, uh, the, you know, the um, uh, Hezbollah and Iran and, and the Syrian regime. Uh, they're both um, not necessarily allies to the U.S. and uh, it's not a big problem if they kill it, each other. The problem with that is, uh, and we've seen it happening, a long war of attrition uh, made Al-Qaeda uh, more powerful and more present in, in Syria, and that's a problem for, for the U.S. And the chemical attacks, uh, the recent chemical attacks, gave the U.S. an opportunity to intervene uh, um, and save, um, and um, without necessarily losing faith. Uh, and that was also a moment when uh, we saw the U.S. starting a conversation and negotiation with Iran uh, over their uh, nuclear uh, program, uh, because um, that's how it's operating. Uh, it's a package. It doesn't. It's not just about the Syrian revolution. It's also about uh, the peace process with the Palestinian and the Israel, and it's also about uh, the uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear program. Um, and so um, we have seen a convergence between the Russian and the U.S. position on on Syria uh, more recently. And you know, I could reduce it to really. Um, uh, two uh, position when it comes to the difference between Russia and, and the U.S. One of them wants Assadism without Assad, that's the U.S. And the other one wants Assadism with Assad, and that's uh, Russia, to put it very simply. Um, and so they're, they're both um, worrying about the presence of, of Al-Qaeda, and um, they want to do something about it. And if you go back to rent uh, study uh, or report, that uh, uh, was published in 2008. Uh, you know, RAND, uh, the research and uh, development uh, organization, uh, a think tank uh, close to uh, uh, the decision making in, in the US. Um, and they were ri writing this report about the Middle East. And um, they say they estimate that the Middle East will still dominate uh, the uh, production of oil in years to come, and that that same region will be the main base for the jihadi groups and Al Qaeda. And so the study suggests that, and here I'm quoting, um, that the best strategy is to divide and rule, which focuses on exploiting fault lines between the various Salafi jihadist groups to turn them against each other and dissipate their energy on internal conflicts. This strategy relies heavily on covert action, information uh, operation, unconventional warfare, and support to indigenous security forces. And more, more and more we're seeing some of that happening in, in Syria where the U.S. through Saudi Arabia is backing some jihadi group to fight Al-Qaeda and forget about the Syrian regime. Um, what about Russia um, now? Um, as I said, there is a lot of overlapping between Russia and, and the U.S. They agree on uh, curbing the influence of, uh, of Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda affiliated groups. Um, but Russia felt a form of betrayal after what happened in Libya, as you know. Um, because they uh, were expecting a different outcome, and they, they were completely marginalized um, in in um, in, uh, in Libya. But more interestingly, and that's not something that we see often in the media, uh, Russia was very skeptical of the Arab Revolt since the beginning. And uh, oftentimes, you know, if you read the intellectuals, I'm not even talking about the politicians. I'm talking about people who are intellectuals, sociologists who are influential in. Uh, political circles and so on, um, they were uh, worrying about those uh, Arab revolts and they were comparing them to the color revolution that were happening in, uh, in the uh, Russian satellite in places like Georgia and Ukraine where um, the, uh, the um, uh, regime or the government um, allied to the Russian were uh, toppled and other um, government took over. Um, and so, um, oftentimes, those sociologists and intellectual, Russian intellectual, write about uh, the possibility of contamination in Central Asia uh, because there are despotic um, uh, figures in places like uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. And um, they don't want to lose those close allies because of economic and uh, geostrategic reasons. Uh, and that's why uh, Russia has been really uh, skeptical since the beginning of even, I'm talking here about the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution and, and so on. Uh, 
And finally, the, uh, the Russians have a major interest in, in the region. Um, as, you, as you know, uh, the Russians have a, a naval facility in Tartus, and that's their only access to uh, the Mediterranean, and they don't want to lose that. In addition, they have um, investment in uh, the Syrian economy, and um, the toppling uh, or change of regime might um, uh, put an end to that. Um, in 2009, their investment was valued to $19 billion. Uh, so this is more or less the dominant um, uh, geopolitical map in the region uh, when it comes to the Syrian uh, revolution um, involving uh, the Russian and, uh, and, um, and the US. But there is a second way to look at, at the conflict, and that's the second geopolitical map. It's a more regional um, proxy war between, on the one hand, Iran and its allies, and on the other, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Israel. And their interests don't necessarily match exactly with um, their allies, whether they are Russian or uh, US, the West. They have their own uh, agenda. Um, and so, um, and interestingly, the, those um, um, political agenda are currently shifting. Um, it's really, we were talking about that earlier. Syria is a moving target. Uh, once you think you understand what's happening, it's already somewhere else. Um, and so because of the negotiation with Iran and because of the emergence of Al-Qaeda, um, more recently, we have seen um, some kind of uh, close relationship or the beginning of a relationship between Iran and Turkey, who have both an interest in ending um, that um, emergence of Al-Qaeda in, in the region. But to go back a little bit, uh, Iran really had a, a geostrategic uh, um, alliance with Syria very early on after the Iranian Revolution um, in the early 1980s because both saw Iraq as a threat and uh, hegemonic in the region and wanted to put an end to that. And also Iran started its nuclear program, had an anti-imperial, anti-US uh, policy and that um, increased its isolation and the need to preserve that alliance with, uh, with Syria. And so uh, they can't really afford uh, losing that, uh, that close ally. Um, but as I suggested, those tectonic plates under, beneath uh, what we see in the media are actually shifting. Um, and um, especially since the election of uh, Rouhani in, in, Iraq, in Iran, who really want to put an end to the uh, economic um, uh, sanctions. And we heard his defense minister, Akbar Tokan, uh, recently um, denouncing those, uh, those sanctions and wanting to put an end um, to those sanctions, and he declared during the electoral, uh, during the presidential uh, campaign a few months ago, um, and here I'm quoting him, who can say that imposing various sanctions on a country is a revolutionary move and in line with serving the political system and the people? In our opinion, rationalism is revolutionary. And that's how he's justifying to the population the need to have uh, a kind of negotiation with the US and the need to end uh, or put an end uh, to those uh, negotiations. The other shift that's been happening is a, a kind of difference between Turkey and Saudi Arabia, who were working very closely together uh, on, on Syria, and were co uh, collaborating and cooperating. <clears throat> More recently, Turkey has been very um, critical of uh, the Saudi uh, influence in Egypt, uh, where they were uh, really influential in toppling the Muslim Brotherhood there, and uh, Turkey obviously with the Muslim or type of Muslim Brotherhood government, were closely allied to uh, the Morsi government um, there, and didn't necessarily appreciate what the uh, Saudi did in, in Egypt. In addition to that, they're critical of the Saudi funding some of the Salafi groups in, in, uh, in Syria who are fighting against the Muslim Brotherhood. Am I, am I making that uh, confusing and complex, or no. are you? Yeah? That's very cool. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump, because... Um, but basically, um, we've, we've seen some kind of uh, dissociation between Turkey and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. And, um, and Saudi Arabia has its own agenda, obviously, in, in, um, in Syria, uh, has been wanting the end of the regime very early on, but especially after the assassination of the Prime Minister uh, Hariri in, in Lebanon in 2005. Um, and what, what uh, Saudi Arabia is doing in Syria is really confusing because on the one hand they are funding the most Salafi groups, the most radical groups, uh, because um, they want to steer some of the fighters who potentially could go to Al-Qaeda to instead go to the, those Salafi groups uh, they are uh, creating and, and, and funding. Uh, 
Uh, but in addition to that, they are funding some nationalist and secular groups, and that's the contradiction and the confusion that the Syrian um, revolution is provoking. And the reason for that, obviously, is uh, to prevent the Salafi from uh, growing too quickly and becoming too dominant, because uh, the Saudi have an interest in preserving uh, a hegemony for Wahhabism, a form of you know, the Saudi uh, uh, Salafism. Uh, and so they, they have an interest in keeping um, um, those, um, uh, those uh, Salafi group uh, small and uh, not too influential. Um, and so they're working on those two, um, those two lines. Um, but since the negotiation between the US and, and, uh, and um, Iran, uh, the, the Saudi and Israel uh, interests have been converging, and um, they have been very critical of what the US is doing in, in Iran, as you know. Uh, because they want really an end to the um, nuclear problem uh, in Iran, and uh, um, they want to really see uh, Iran bleed in, in Syria. Um, and so that's why they're not necessarily, uh, and that's the tension I was talking about uh, earlier between uh, the US and uh, its allies and the region. So that's the second geopolitical map um, uh, that I'm talking about. The third one uh, is. Um, a form of clash of civilization, and it's the one that's being imposed by Al Qaeda, who's trying to impose that kind of binary, um, a war between Sunni and non-Sunni, a Sunni and the infidels, black and white, basically, uh, the enemies of Islam that need to be eradicated, uh, and there is no nuance there. Um, you are, you know, they're borrowing um, the famous uh, Bush slogan: "You're either with us or against us." There is no room for negotiation, no room for nuance no room for gradation. Um, and that's why many of the activists I was talking about earlier are you know, being killed, incarcerated, tortured by Al-Qaeda, who's interested in really imposing that binary framework, a dichotomy, a Manichaean kind of, of word, uh, where there is no room for any kind of conversation or civil society or negotiation or even like speech or discourse. Um, that's, that's not um, what they're doing. And the Salafi and the Jihadist and Al Qaeda group have been their influence has been growing since uh, the early 2012 uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is um, again because of the funding that's been coming from uh, the Gulf, and uh, Kuwait has been a, a major hub, uh, and we can talk about that and why is that. Um, it's coming from the Gulf state, but also individuals um, who are you know who embrace the Salafi and uh, a globalist Salafi, whether they are. Um, for um, Al Qaeda or not, and they're sending a lot of uh, money. Uh, Al Qaeda is extremely wealthy; uh, they have a lot of money. They're uh, the only one that pay uh, salaries to their fighters. Uh, most other groups don't afford to do that. Um, they're actually um, begging for weapons, but they don't have. And sometimes they're begging for food, but they don't have money to pay to uh, to their fighters. And that's why Al Qaeda has been able to uh, attract some uh, some Syrians and mostly foreigners. Um, to fight with them. But the second reason is because um, there is a pious uh, Syrian population and more and more um, they have been attentive and willing to listen to the preaching of some jihadi out of desperation. And the longer the conflict or the revolution will last, the more we're going to see some of that happening. Um, the, the, the third reason is uh, because of Iran, Hezbollah, and some Shia uh, br um, Iraqi brigades uh, coming and supporting and you know uh, investing themselves in, in Syria on the one hand and then uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Qatar and, and so on and on the other and that's uh, created the split between Shia and, uh, and, and Sunni and more and more Syrian are perceiving the uh, revolution as one between Shia and Sunni Alawite uh, against, uh, against Sunni. Um, the fourth reason is the flow of some jihadi from Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Tunisia, Chechen, and others. But most importantly, and I think this is not uh, really um, well known or well uh, or known enough, is uh, the Syrian uh, regime involvement and creation of that jihadi uh, uh, aspect of, of the revolution. As you know, uh, Syria was a major hub for the jihadi to go into Iraq. Uh, smuggled into the um, uh, border and go fight um, the Americans there. And they were coming from all over the Arab world and even beyond. And Syria had training camps, and um, the Syrians who are here might have heard and know Al Qaqa, who was um, put by the security, had grown a beer, and uh, was funded and was operating openly. He had 
uh, a training camp, and uh, you know the, the, the fighters were using weapons and so on. And if you know Syria, you know that this is not something that could happen. He was released uh, in 2011 from the prisons of Assad. Uh -huh. uh, he was released. He was released in Right, right. Yeah. I, I was actually going to talk about that, and uh, many others were released uh, from prison after the revolution started. Uh, they were in Sednaya uh, prison, and more than 1,500 of them were released. Um, and that's a, that's a time. You know, we're talking about. It was in July 2011. That's a time when you have so many peaceful activists, media activists, who were incarcerated and who were put in prison, and were tortured and were killed inside Syrian prisons when the jihadi were released. July 2011, um, and um, today those jihadi, I can give you a few, few examples, um, for example, Al, um, uh, what's his name, uh, the head of the Syrian, uh, the uh, Muslim army, uh, Alush, Zahir Alush, Al Al uh, is actually leading an army of 30,000 people, he was in prison in Sadnaya uh, two years ago, uh, the head of uh, the uh, um, uh, Ahrar al-Sham, 20,000 fighters was in prison uh, two, two years ago. The head of Sukhur al-Sham, 9,000 fighters, uh, was the head um, uh, was in prison uh, two years ago, and many, many others, and many fighters uh, in Al-Qaeda. So big question marks. Um, I'm not necessarily a big um, you know, proponent for conspiracy theory. I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but I, I think that there is a lot of overlaps and uh, common interest in, in doing so. Again, uh, the Syrian regime want to portray the revolution as one you know, where uh, as, uh, as a Syrian regime fighting those jihadi and those Salafi and Al-Qaeda and so on. And that's, you know, a narrative that many people will listen to uh, and, um, you know, will be um, opposed to. Uh, and so that's the interest of the Syrian regime in, in doing so. Um, and finally, in February, a few, few months later, um, between this and that, in February 2012, the Syrian Authority announced the release of Abu Musab al-Suri, uh, those who are interested in, you know, in those jihadi groups know who uh, Abu Musab al-Suri is. His real name is Mustafa bin Ab Abdul Ghadir uh, Sid Maryam, one of the most prominent theorists of Salafi jihadism in the world. Um, and the U.S. was actually very, uh, very upset about that, and um, uh, obviously they couldn't do much about it. Um, he was released in, um, in February 2012. Again, um, we know the consequences. I'm not going to talk about that more, but we can talk about that uh, in the Q&A. The fourth um, geopolitical map I'm talking about here is the Kurdish autonomous movement. And um, I think we have to distinguish between two things. Uh, the Kurds were extremely um, involved in the revolution. There was a very vibrant um, grassroots movement in the beginning. And that was killed by the Syrian regime, um, mostly but also by the traditional Kurdish parties who had an interest in keeping their hegemony and dominance. And so they had an interest in preventing this you know, uh, young um, activist who had aspiration beyond the Kurdish uh, region and wanted to really be part of that Syrian revolution. And so um, the Kurds were not killing people, uh, but they were incarcerating them. And I'm talking here about uh, the PYD, the, um, the Democratic Union Party. Um, but also the regime has been extremely violent uh, against the, the uh, Kurdish regions in places where we've seen you know, thousands and thousands of people demonstrating against the regime. And finally, they killed Mash'al Timmu in, um, in October 2011, one of um, the most charismatic uh, Kurdish leaders who was at the head of this um, grassroots movement. And therefore, the Kurdish question uh, became really a state question, not anymore the question of uh, revolution and change of regime. And uh, the Kurdish parties, um, the traditional Kurdish parties, think like a state and they behave like a state. And that's why I'm putting them here as one of the geopolitical maps I'm talking about, uh, because they really have a state um, project. And they're really uh, thinking the space in those abstract terms, you know, the top-down kind of um, thinking, uh, against the thinking of the initial uh, emerging grassroots movement that was killed, that was thinking along the line of the left space um, from the bottom up. Um, we can talk more about the Kurdish um, question, but I just want to say that there are a lot of tension. It's not homogeneous. Obviously, the Iraqi Kurds are not necessarily um, uh, supporting the uh, PYD or the PKK. They have their di di divergences. The PKK, uh, the, the Turkish part of the movement, 
is against the uh, Turkish government, obviously. The Iraqi part of the movement is allied to uh, the Turkish part, and obviously Turkey is manipulating all that, and uh, there are oil interests. Iraq is exporting, the uh, Kurdish Iraq is exporting oil to Turkey and so on. So it's messy, it's not simple, but um, uh, I'm leaving it um, there, we can talk more about it. And finally, the last um, geopolitical map I'm going to talk about uh, uh, today is, um, and this is the most frustrating to me because this is the one I was expecting the least. Um, all the other ones were expected. Uh, we knew what those states were doing and so on. The last one is the one that's been really imposed on us by um, the non-aligned movement, um, by um, leftist and progressive intellectuals and parties who think that what's happening is really, um, what's happening in Syria is a war against um, an anti-imperialist regime, an anti-imperialist uh, government. And that's how they are perceiving uh, the conflict. Um, and they have been really replicating the Salafi or the uh, Al-Qaeda uh, reading in the sense that it's binary. There is no room for nuance. There is no room for negotiation. There is no complexity. You are either imperialist if you are the US and the West, or you are anti-imperialist, and they are obviously anti-imperialist. And the anti-imperialism made them allied to the Syrian regime, because the, uh, the Syrian, according to their narrative, and we can talk about that, which, you know, obviously I don't agree with it. I think that uh, the Syrian regime has been very detrimental to the Palestinian question, has been killing many Palestinians, has been undermining the Palestinian struggle um, throughout um, its history. It's not something new. Um, but clearly, some of those people don't know that history, or they, they chose to uh, really... Um, Islamophobic, that's it. They yeah. Islamophobic. yeah, or ignore it. Uh, and so, um, to give you just a simple example to illustrate what I mean, a British socialist, John Rees, um, uh, in an interview or an article said that he can't support the revolution because the unions in Syria are not supporting it. And uh, there is no working class uh, that's really against the Syrian regime. So I don't see why I would be uh, for the Syrian regime. The problem is um, the union have been dismantled and completely destroyed in the early 1980s. Uh, and if John Rees knew anything about Syrian history, he would know that currently the unions are controlled by the Ba'ath. And they are, you know, whatever they do is dictated by al -Bad. So there's nothing to, to do there or see there. Um, but he's still waiting uh, for the union to start, um, you know, opposing the Syrian regime. Um, the other example is uh, Tariq Ali. And um, he's a friend, and I respect Tariq Ali, but I think that he's very wrong on the question of Syria. Pakistani, Pakistani uh, British intellectual, uh, very uh, interesting individual. Um, one of the uh, most comprehensive and smart people who wrote and uh, talked about uh, third world issues and uh, anti-war movement and, and so on. Um, but he's been uh, really reproducing the narrative of the Syrian regime. And most recently after the uh, chemical attacks, he's been invited to different media shows and he's been saying we shouldn't be rushing and accusing the Syrian regime. We don't know, we don't have enough evidence, maybe it's the rebels and so on and so forth. Um, and so um, this is uh, part of what uh, those intellectuals are doing. In addition to that, there is the anti-war move, uh, anti movement in the US and Britain. In addition to that, there is the Occupy movement, unfortunately. In addition to that, there are part of the BDS Palestinian movement, again, who have embraced that kind of reductive reading, uh, the black and white, the, you are either uh, imperialist or anti-imperialist. And the most heartbreaking is really the, uh, the Palestinian, because that's something I've been involved with and, and so on. Uh, but interestingly enough, most of that is coming from the Palestinian diaspora living in the West, in, in Europe, and, and the US and Canada, uh, who think that the Syrian regime is being punished because the Syrian regime has been supporting the Palestinian cause. Uh, and that's what's happening uh, in Syria. And there's nothing more than that. And what's happening, those so-called protests and so on, are really conspiracy. There's no, uh, no real revolution. Um, but the Palestinians who live in Syria and the Palestinians who live in Lebanon and Palestine uh, have a different view, at least many of them. Um, they I actually, uh, I'm, um, I'm part of this global network of activists and we're in touch with many activists in Palestine and in, other, uh, in, in, in Syria and we often talk with each other and so on. And we're very frustrated with that because 
Those are the Palestinians that understand what's happening and they are, understand the violence of the Syrian regime. The Al camp, just to give an example, brief example, um, <clears throat> has been completely besieged by the uh, by the Syrian army, and uh, it's true that you know we're done with the chemical, hopefully with the chemical chemical weapon in Syria, but uh, the Syrian regime is using a new weapon of mass destruction and that's starvation. And uh, Ali Al Mook camp is one of those places where the people, the population is starving. I mean, the picture that you see are heartbreaking, uh, and people can't leave. Um, and we we're talking about that earlier. Uh, there are people who uh, are willing, you know, to um, to surrender. Um, Eight hundred of them, and I'm in touch with them and so on. And we were telling them, you know, you're going to be killed if you surrender. You know what the Syrian regime does. Uh, the Syrian regime is going to kill you, torture you. Why? Why would you do that? And they were saying, well, we are the sons of our, you know, our parents, and we want to save them, and we want food and medication to come back to uh, the camp, and that's why we're surrendering. We know that you know this might have uh, major reper repercussions. Um, and in addition to that, there are the BRICS uh, countries like Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa um, who are supporting again uh, this um, and replicating that kind of narrative um, of imperialism and anti-imperialism. And finally, I want to briefly talk about media because I think it's important and it's really influential. I give the example of RT, um, the Russian TV or Russian uh, Russia Today. Some of you are might be familiar and know what that is. Uh, but Russia, the Russia TV has been extremely influential when it comes to um, leftist circles, progressive circles, in uh, portraying and representing the narrative of the Syrian regime. And the reason for that is because Russia obviously have their own interests, as I described earlier, their own geopolitical geopolitics, and that's obviously. <coughs> Um, trying to oppose and counter the U.S. hegemony. And part of the, what they have been doing in the past two years since the crisis is covering, and I say I have to say that they have been covering very well the Occupy movement and uh, you know the union um, mobilization in Europe and the working class movement in Europe and so on. And so they gained some kind of credibility among certain circles. And now uh, those circles, uh, leftist, progressive, have a tendency to get all the news about Syria from um, from uh, RT, and there are other examples, uh, but RT, and um, you know, there are, there are many examples of that, have been fabricating a lot of news, and we have evidence about that, um, you know, about the chemical weapons and, uh, and many other stories. So um, this is, again, I'm, I'm talking about uh, another geopolitical maps. Obviously, media and leftist intellectuals, and they're not state, and they don't necessarily think like a state, but I thought that it would be interesting to, you know, um, think about what they're doing and uh, the repercussions of, uh, of what they're doing. So after this long uh, geopolitical introduction, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, Manbij, um, and then hopefully uh, we will have more time to talk about it uh, in the Q&A. Just to give you a sense and a feeling of what I saw in, in Syria, and here I'm going to really talk about the lived experience, the lived space that I was uh, talking about earlier, and try to be you know, embedded with the population and see what they're doing uh, on the ground and how they're struggling. Um, you know, Menbej is, uh, again, as I said, um, their major problem was they had this um, underground revolutionary council that was working for almost five months before liberation. And they built a whole network of popular committees during the occupation of their cities. So when the, uh, uh, the police and the security were in the city, they started building the popular uh, committees. And the role of the popular committees was to protect the city once uh, the security and the police leave the city. Uh, and we were talking about, about that earlier. You know, just think about a big city, um, half a million people, and, um, you know, Boston or a little bit smaller, and overnight the state leaves, uh, and the institutions are empty, and you have to take over, and you don't necessarily have the expertise or the knowledge, and yet you have to have a functioning city overnight. Um, it's a gigantic endeavor, and it's very inspiring when you see it happening. We don't think about it. But this is the revolution I'm talking about. How is it that people overnight can take an entire city? And, you know, it makes me dizzy when you think about it. I mean, how is it that, you know, you go to institution, you go to the files, you read, you know, the stuff that the state was, um, 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 <clears throat> was producing, and you see half-empty glasses of tea, um, there were people here and the left, and you have to start um, providing to the population, providing bread and 
electricity and phone and uh, have a functioning city and the traffic and the police and security and you know, everything that a city needs. Uh, and that's what Manbij was doing for the past year and two months. And this is the revolution that I want us to really talk more about. And these are some of the challenges that we should be thinking as people who care about the Syrian revolution and want to see the revolution go somewhere. Uh, unfortunately, what we talk about is really the geopolitical maps. Where are the revolutionaries? Where are the red areas and the green areas? Did we, have, did we advance in Aleppo or not? What neighborhood did we lose or not? And I think this is interesting, but this is not the whole story. Um, I think the more interesting story is what do you do when you have no expertise in running a, a gigantic, one of the biggest mills in, in Syria, a mill that can grind up to 500 tons of, of flour, uh, of, uh, of wheat, turn, them, uh, turn that into flour, and produce enough bread for a million people. Um, how do you operate that uh, when you don't have the expertise? When the director uh, of, of the mills, because he was appointed by the regime, every few weeks threatens to leave, uh, and that means starvation of the population. So you can't afford losing him. Same thing with uh, the city hall, um, with architects who work in the city hall. Same thing with people who uh, operate you know, the, the phone center and uh, the electricity. Uh, all the workers who you know, want a raise when you don't have any revenues and are operating you know, the electricity on um, uh, Tishrin Bridge. Uh, what do you do without electricity and so on? And so those are some of the questions that the revolutionaries were, were trying to resolve um, without necessarily the expertise, without the knowledge. Um, and you know what they have been trying to do is have a, a parallel shift. For example, I, I've been uh, uh, following very closely what happened in the, in the, uh, in the mills because I think um, it's really important. And you know, the, the, um, um, the uh, starvation uh, on the, uh, the nightmare of starvation on the horizon, and people always think about starvation, uh, made the mills like a central institution in the city. That's why Al-Qaeda took the mills and um, they were liberated uh, because the entire population rose up and they, they wanted their mills back. Uh, Ahrar Sham, another Salafi group, took uh, the, the, uh, the mills and um, they were opposed by the entire population and uh, the mills were liberated twice. And, and I think this is the power of the, of the revolution. How is it that Al-Qaeda with their 10,000 fighters are removed from uh, the mills? Um, and you know, I think this is the story that we don't hear. Uh, about often enough, and we don't hear about the strategizing and organizing to make that possible. Um, and um, you know, sending a message to Al Qaeda that if you don't leave the mills, there will be consequences, and Al Qaeda abiding by that and leaving the mills. And so the uh, the revolutionaries put an entire um, group of people, uh, engineers and others, uh, who are uh, observing the workers in order to be able to operate the mills uh, once or if. Uh, the workers leave, and if you know the, the director or, uh, of the mills um, who's always threatening lives, and so to be able to uh, keep that going and provide to the population. Um, I, I talked to um, many uh, organizations. I'm going to mention just uh, a few examples. Uh, one organization was really interesting, uh, interested in uh, providing alternative medicine. Um, as you know, it's extremely uh, difficult to get any kind of uh, medication. Um, uh, doctors are um, a very um, uh, 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 very few, and um, there is high demand. And uh, same thing with any kind of, of medication. And so she was in touch with um, a, a doctor in Germany who was um, giving her recipes um, to come up with some kind of medication out of the local herbs, things that you can find in, in Menbij. Uh, to be able to, you know, um, kind of get some kind of, of medication uh, on a temporary, uh, uh, for, for a temporary moment, uh, again, to, to, to provide for the injured and, and so on. Um, and two more things before I, I stop. I, I know that I, I've been wrong, but um, I think that the participatory and the local democracy that people are building is extremely interesting. And this is going to be extremely important for the post-Assad uh, period. Because uh, those local groups, those local councils, uh, are building a participatory uh, democracy really uh, entrenched in those uh, local regions. And uh, they're going to be able to challenge the centralized government that's going to be appointed later on. And that's not going to be necessarily very democratic. 
Uh, but I think uh, what's happening on those, um, uh, in, in those areas, uh, on questions of democracy and rethinking that democracy, and trying to build and think that democracy from the traditional culture. Um, and I've been to the trustee councils where you know, they organize weekly meeting, and again, uh, because people are, um, uh, the, the, the uh, regime has informants, they know when the trustee council meets. Um, there are 600 um, members to that council, and they discuss everything in the city, whereas, uh, whether it's garbage or any kind of uh, conflict between families, any kind of uh, problems in the city. Uh, but there are always the threats of the airplane strikes, uh, because they know that uh, they were meeting and I was attending those. Uh. And so you hear people who you don't expect to hear. And I was really surprised to hear people who don't necessarily use you know, very fancy words or very fancy uh, concept, but yet had very complex ideas about how to build that democracy and how to rebuild the institution and how to solve those you know, very complex problems in their city. Um, and that was very humbling and very empowering and very surprising. I wasn't expecting that, and I have to say that I was caught by, uh, by surprise uh, with that.